Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 27. And so the theme today is going to be about communicating why, and, and why I think this is a key I I reason why people are either doing a good job or not doing a good job around the country. And we'll put that one in the, in the context of the latest numbers and uh, more on mass, and I've linked to the Harvard Business Review article because I think it's a good article. So how are we doing in the United States? The answer is not well. Um, we had been doing a little bit better for a while there, uh, but then are starting to get much worse and the trend is not in the right direction. Uh, I guess the only consolation is Brazil is doing such a bad job they could overtake us actually. Uh, why is it uh, doing what it's doing? Well, it's, it's kind of a mixed reaction. So if you look at the, the average, of course, it does tell, it's a different story than if you look at the example. So New York, that was a, the biggest reason for this big hump initially, but they're doing great right now. So what's happening is the is states across the South are really screwing up right now. So Texas had the, the a record number of cases today. Arizona had a record number of cases today. Uh, Florida, many other states across the uh, the South have, are getting you know record increases in cases. And so I think we're rapidly going to get worse than things were a few months ago. Uh, why? Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of politicians open too soon. They ignored the advice of their epidemiologists, uh, which usually isn't a good idea. Uh, they had no communication plan in place about masks and distancing. Uh, they had inadequate testing still, uh, and they've been too slow to respond to, to imperfect information. There's a great uh, op-ed a while back from George Will that I wrote, and I left his quote on leadership about to govern is to choose always on the basis of imperfect information. And unfortunately, in the face of imperfect information, they're just not being cautious enough. And so they're making mistakes, uh, unfortunately, across the country right now. Uh, although some are finally reversing themselves, so Arizona Governor Doug Ducey finally did reverse himself on, on requiring masks in public settings, for example, but only after uh, you know lots and lots of doctors wrote into him saying that was a bad idea, basically. So he f has finally listened, but probably too little too late. Um, essentially, you know, uh, we're, we're repeating history just over and over again. New York was our Philadelphia where things got out of control too quite quickly. And honestly, I think de Blasio and, and Cuomo waited too long and they're partly to blame. Uh, but across the South, we're having our St. Louis's just over and over again that, that they had an in, incomplete response open too soon. Uh, essentially, they're repeating all the mistakes that St. Louis made and they're reporting it, repeating that mistake 20 and 25 times, it appears. Um, if you want to look at them in context to each other uh, and on the same scale, you know, New York, ugh, things were horrible for a while. Nebraska, we started great, then got horrible with our meat processing facilities, finally responded. And those are actually getting really better, but now we're kind of hovering. And then again, as I'll get to in a minute, we're of a mixed response in Nebraska, just like we have the mixed United States. You have Arizona, which is headed uh, potentially Phoenix, Arizona could be worse than New York City in a few weeks here. And potentially not followed not too uh, long afterwards by South uh, Carolina, Arkansas, Florida, Texas. Mississippi, state after state in the south having increases. Hopefully they respond before Arizona did because Arizona is probably too little too late. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Will Rogers, there are ki three kinds of men, the one that learned by reading, the men who learned by observation, the rest just got to pee on the electric fence. Uh, I grew up in western Nebraska, was always smart enough not to pee on the electric fence, but apparently we have governors and mayors across the country that are not smart enough to, pee on, uh, to not pee on the electric fence. So uh, my big worry is, is what about Nebraska going forward? So a couple ways to look at it. Nebraska, there's a mixed picture within Nebraska, and we have to decide what is actually safe. And so one thing to think about, a lot of epidemiologists are looking at comparison of rates per 100,000. And so if you look at these graphs, I'm going to show you, this is the number of people infected per 100,000 with these benchmarks as possible rates. And these, these benchmarks were thrown out by Ali Khan, our dean of our College of Public Health, who's one of the world's leading experts on this. These are his numbers. They're not perfect. He'll acknowledge that they're not perfect. But this is kind of what most of the world is sending around is these thresholds of five per 100,000, two and a half, 0 0.5, one, this general range. And so Nebraska as a whole, we're kind of getting the right trend. Well, we got a little blip there, of course, but you know, we might be getting down there, but results vary across the state, just like the results vary across the country. So here's another way of looking at it. So here's that same slide I just showed you with those rates there. Uh, you know, New York City, this is what they look like, and they're getting, they're headed down to the right place. They're not out of the, out of the woods yet, but they're being very cautious as they open. It's not the same, I would say the same is not necessarily true of Nebraska, especially Omaha. So Douglas and Sarpy County's numbers, if you'll see here, they're way above those thresholds that Ollie thinks are safe, and I agree with Ollie. I don't think they're anywhere close to safe. Uh, Lancaster County luckily never had that big heat peak like everybody else. We we're, we're, we hopefully are getting it right initially and hopefully, hopefully continuing to get it right, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm most worried about Douglas and Sarpy counties. Uh, is the mayor of uh, Omaha and our governor going to pee on that electric fence? Only time will tell uh, because they're way above this threshold. I don't think it's okay for Omaha to be loosening up further, especially without more emphasis on wearing masks. 
Why is that number 15 versus 5 versus 1 so important? Well, here's why. Uh, one case per 100,000 with an exponential spread could go to 500 within one to two weeks. We can handle 500 cases in, Link in Omaha, Nebraska. They have enough contact tracing. They have enough hospital capacity that one case per 100,000 going to 500 total cases in the city would be doable. But if you're at 15 cases per 100,000 and you get hit an exponential fa spread phase because you open too quickly, you could rapidly be at 7,500 cases. That's enough to overwhelm all the contact tracing and the Nebraska uh, Medical Center. If you start getting that 7,500 and then trying to tamp that down and it takes you a month to tamp that down, you will overwhelm the hospitals in, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. So we haven't made that mistake yet. I hope we won't make that mistake, but I guess time will tell whether Omaha gets it right. Uh, other sites, there's another site out now called the COVID, covidact.now.org, which I think has a ni nice, interesting way of looking at. They're looking at those infection rates. They kind of put uh, Nebraska in sort of that medium range, which is kind of fits with Ali Khan's. Uh, they talk about contact tracing and saying, and so we are getting hopefully enough contact tracers in Nebraska. The one thing they don't talk about, and I think this is one of our still our glaring exceptions and problems in Nebraska, is our testing issues. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, here's the Lincoln Lancaster County sites, and I've talked about this in the past. Uh, that there was a time uh, a few weeks, a few uh, well, about a month ago, basically, where we had 91 cases reported in one day. Well, those 91 cases didn't happen this Monday, actually. They happened this week. So there's a hole here. It just got delayed here. Why? Because the doctors ordered all tests here, and it was taking a week to get the test results back. Well, this hole here is this hole here going to be like this? Uh, I don't know. And honestly, I can tell you that the doctors in Lincoln, Nebraska are telling me it's taking three to five days again now to get their test back. So we could find out Monday next week that this is actually going to be another big peak and suddenly we're taking off again. Or maybe we're not. Maybe we're okay. Maybe our trend is down. But we don't know, again, because our testing is still woefully inadequate in Nebraska because of test turnaround time. Ideally, Test Nebraska would help us with that, but they won't listen to us or talk to any of us. So we don't know where we're going to go. And so this means we're somewhat falling blind, which means we have to be very cautious about opening up any more than we already have because our testing is still so inadequate in Nebraska, especially exposed to with regard to turnaround time. So given that problem, what can you do as an individual? So I think the big thing is, is you to educate yourself on why. Why are all these recommendations being put out there? And people don't follow recommendations just because they're told to, but if they understand why, they're much more likely to respond, which is kind of what the text of the Harvard Business Review article is. Good leadership is about making sure people understand why this is set this the way that it is. So where did six feet come from? Six feet is not a magic number, and it's not an absolute. It's not like 5.9 uh, feet isn't enough, and 6.1 suddenly is. Uh, it's based on basically droplet spread and looking at all other infections that are droplet spread, whether it, be, whether it be meningitis or influenza or whatever. And so essentially it started, initially it was three feet, and that's because of meningitis outbreaks in schools where they found that school kids sitting within three feet of the initial case were more likely to have caught meningitis. We don't see those cases anymore because we immunize against them. Uh, but it wasn't 100%. There were a few, and so this is what they're illustrating here, that you know mostly out of within three feet are good, but yet get, there may be a few later. The other thing, this is a classroom setting where most of the kids are sitting quietly listening. They're not yelling, singing, screaming, coughing, sneezing, where suddenly even six feet isn't, isn't enough. Uh, and so this droplet spread combined with masking, and so it's a combination thing. It has to do with both of these things, not just one or the other. It has One by itself does not work. And so people keep quoting me, well, this study said if you don't wear a mask, it won't work. Well, it depends on everything else, too. It depends on everybody else wearing the masks. So the six feet is a combination thing. It's not an absolute variable, it's a combination of things. Distance plus time. So for example, in our school board meeting, when people came up for public comment, they would sometimes pull down their mask to speak better into the microphone. That was actually perfectly safe. Why? Because their their one, their time is limited to five minutes, so that wasn't enough. And on top of that, they were they're about twenty feet away from everybody. So even if they were yelling, we probably still would have been fine because you had a combination of one twenty feet of distance and a short time of five minutes. Again, outside versus outside, inside is a totally different story. So uh, this last couple of weeks, we were worried with the protest caused an outbreak, and it's so, so far that it has not. And I think the combination, if you looked at all the all the BLM people who showed up the, at the hearing yet last night, they were all actually all wearing masks. So I think the protesters, they were, they were, were spacing themselves out of enough for wearing masks that actually it was fine to have a mask group like that because they were both outside and wearing masks. Uh, there are activities where you can't wear a mask, in which case you need more distance. And there's times where I actually have meetings, even internally, where we don't all wear masks for that whole hour, but we're sitting on opposite sides of a big boardroom table. We're like 20 feet away from each other, and there's only two of us, so the number of people. And then again, the type of activity. These all play into the variable. 
uh, masks and why and so one of my frustrations is people continuously quoting uh, articles out of context and there's a file with a Kubot art, uh, letter that's been going around from the Omaha diocese saying no you don't have to wear masks interestingly enough someone misquoted last night the same exact study so here is the actual study that they're misquoting uh, a couple things number one it's it's from over a month ago so that's one thing to keep in mind too it's this perspective this is not a research article this is people voicing their opinions this is an opinion piece not a research piece also the, the line they're quoting which is right here and it makes it sound like maybe you don't need a mask well first of all this is an opinion and they're ignoring the context around the, the whole discussion kind of like when someone uh, takes one little bible verse and then ignores the whole story around the bible verse uh, yes it's true that the face mask by itself just you might not work but they go on later to talk about with the number of asymptomatic people out there and how things were getting spread that masking all providers might limit transmission and guess what in the last month we've had mon mon many articles basing saying yes that does in fact work and so this is an old article taken out of context partly wrong and in within the same article there's a hypothesis that has now since been proven. How proven is it? Uh, well, it, it, it partly it's the context again. So if this person's wearing a mask, this isn't good enough because this person is spreading too many droplets. But if this person's wearing a mask and this person, that, that there's just, there's so few droplets that that's now suddenly this does become effective. So it's a threshold thing and it's both people. And the article evidence is getting so solid uh, that last night on our on our school board hearing where people wanted to argue against masks, I asked uh, the medical society and physicians of Lincoln, would you write me a letter for support? Within one week, I had letters of support from four community, uh, state medical organizations, the Nebraska Medical Association, Alaska and Castro County Medical Society, Nebraska Academy of Physicians, and the Nebraska American Academy of Pediatrics, plus 124 Lincoln physicians also agreeing with the Lancaster County Medical Center. In my entire career, I've never gotten four uh, medical associations, 124 physicians to agree on anything. But within one week, I had this saying, yes, Lincoln Public Schools should be using masks. So masks, yes, we're gonna use masks, but there will be exceptions, people. So relax on this, we're not stupid. But you have to start from 100% and work back. You cannot start from, A, we'd like you to wear a mask. Would you please wear a mask? We know in public health that an opt-in approach versus an opt-out is, is the difference between failure and excess. An example would be organ donations. If you use an, take an organ donation approach, which is what we use in Nebraska, say, do you want to opt into organ donation? You'll at best get 20 to 30% of people saying yes. But if you start with an opt-out mentality, where other which other states and countries use, where you say, uh, you have to opt out of organ donation, suddenly you'll get 90 plus percent. And so the difference is how you approach it. So so approaching it from the side of please wear a mask will not work. You have to start from 100% and work back. Yes, we know there are medical conditions that will prevent some kids from wearing a mask. Yes, we know there are behavioral conditions in autism, for example, that might prevent someone from wearing a mask. Yes, we know there may be anxiety. We know that speech pathologists, for example, may need to see a mouth, in which case, well, we have another alternative. You could use a face shield, for example, in that situation. So yes, there will be an exceptions. And yes, we know that it's going to be hard to get kindergartners to wear a mask. We're not stupid. Uh, but you have to get high percentages. And so this is a modeling study that was done that is again confirming you have to get every, almost everybody rushed. Not 100%, but well over 75%. And if you stop with an opt-in, you're not gonna get there. It's very, very similar to vaccines in schools. Uh, are there some kids who go to school without a vaccine? Yes, but they're very, very few. And your child can be sent home if they do not have their vaccination, just like we could send your kid home if they're not gonna wear a mask, unless they have a very, very, very good reason to not wear a mask. Um, and there was also a, a lot of misinformation last night at the school board hearing. So the, the misinformation that, oh, kids don't get coronavirus. Well, actually, as of this morning, over 1,900 Nebraska children have gotten coronavirus and there has been one death. So yes, they do get it. And yes, across the world, there have already been outbreaks within a school setting of coronavirus. Uh, there was an Israeli outbreak of over 120 cases in just one school. So yes, children can get coronavirus and yes, they can spread it. And although they themselves are not gonna get sick, we're not, that's not the issue here. It's their parents, it's their grandparents, it's the teachers we have to prevent from getting sick. So we need the kids to wear a mask so they don't get everybody else sick. Uh, other exemptions. And so, yes, kindergartners are going to be hard. Uh, but you know what? Schools across the world are figuring this out. This is an elementary school in Japan. You can see all of them wearing masks. Now, is it going to be perfect? No. Uh, but we can work with them. And uh, partly we have to educate children. And, uh, gee, that's kind of what the link of the schools do is educate children. So there are ways to get here. Uh, the other thing that was sort of, uh, was almost hard not to laugh is my child will be too hypoxic to learn. The mask will make them sick. Well, you know, surgeons have been wearing masks for a hundred years now and they're not falling over sick and they're not 
to hypoxia to learn. Frankly, they can do brain surgery while they're wearing a mask. So your child can learn. And it's also not just surgeons, for example. There are other professions uh, where they're doing you know, mold and asbestos mitigation. They're doing just fine with a mask. They're not going to die and keel over. Now, I would add one caveat. It is uncomfortable to wear a mask a long time. I get it. Uh, you'll notice, though, that, that this guy here, for example, he's not using ear loops. He's using ties. Uh, ear loop uh, masks are nice if you're just walking into a grocery store, throw it on, come out of the grocery store, or take it off again. But if you're going to wear a mask for hours on end, you might not want to use ear loops, for example. I get it. I find, I find them uncomfortable, too. Uh, but you know what? K people across the world are doing masks and they're doing just fine. These are people in hot, humid Kyoto. They're doing just fine. You might not, you shouldn't wear a mask while doing a timed mile, of course. And there's that example from China. Well, don't be stupid, people. Uh, so they get to the end of the day, you got to set your own social bubble and your own risk tolerance. There are times where I don't wear a mask. I don't wear a mask on the bike path. I don't wear it when I'm walking my dog. Uh, we didn't wear masks when we went to Glacial Till last week, and it was a beautiful night out. Uh, it's fine. Uh, we've got, we're one, we're outside, we're about six feet apart. We also have a small social bubble. It's my in-laws, and we hang out regularly together, but we don't do that in public, you know, in a general group where everybody else is. I did bring my mask, and I did put it on, on when I went inside. And then when we got and do specific things, like go get a haircut, go to the shore then we throw our masks on. So be a little reasonable about this. So again, hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, these are the you know, responses I get pretty much on a daily or even hourly basis at this point. Uh, these aren't necessarily the opinions of everybody I work for, but this is what I do for a living so that I'm not just some kid, uh, some guy, internet troll in someone's basement uh, spouting off about these. This is what I do for a living and it applies to everything. Hopefully this is helpful to you.